DaVinci Resolve is one of the most powerful video editing programs in the world, used by countless creators and even in major movies. It has hundreds of amazing features for editing, effects, audio production, and color grading, and I know how to use precisely none of them. This needs to change. So over the next 7 days, I'm going to go from having never even touched Resolve to being able to edit an entire video in it. And at the end, you'll see the final result. The first step to using DaVinci Resolve is, obviously, installing it. For a normal person, this would be a short, simple process, but it ended up taking me almost an hour, which is a great start to a time-limited challenge. After successfully opening the app for the first time, it was time to begin learning the UI. My goal for day one was to learn the basic skills necessary for video editing. Resolve has many tabs, each used for a different part of the editing process. I began with the Edit tab, where I added the voiceover recordings for this video. The usual next step in my editing process is to add an equalizer to my voice, so almost immediately I had to head over to the audio tab. I used a tutorial to add EQ to my voiceover, and then returned to the edit page. Now, in order to successfully edit a video, there are a few things I need to be able to do, which include moving and cutting clips. The interface for these actions is pretty simple. Each one has its own tool, and their usage is quite straightforward. By the end of day one, I had successfully cut up and arranged my voiceover. Next, I would have to begin editing video. At the beginning of day 2 of this challenge, I wanted to start the video by showing an image which would quickly zoom in to fill the screen. This effect is simple enough, but with my DaVinci Resolve knowledge level at zero, it took a while to get working. In the process of creating it, I learned about adjustment clips. Adjustments are a special type of clip in Resolve, which you can add effects to, and the effects will apply to everything below the adjustment clip in the timeline. I used one to make my zoom effect, which was totally unnecessary, but was pretty cool. I then went down a rabbit hole learning the basics of Fusion, Resolve's effects system. It uses nodes similar to Godot's visual scripting to create complex effects which can be animated. It's also extremely complex, and by the end of day two, I still had no idea how to actually do anything with it, making my research a massive waste of time. I also realized that two-sevenths of the time I had to edit this video was gone, and I hadn't even finished the intro. With this discouraging thought in mind, I closed Resolve. At the dawn of day three, I had only one thing on my mind, movement. Movement is an essential element of many of my videos, and I had no idea how it was done in Resolve, although to be honest, I don't really understand how it works in my old editor either. Anyway, I knew I wouldn't be able to create a real fire at dev video without learning how to edit movement, so I got to work. Movement in Resolve is done through keyframes. Keyframes are a simple system which can be used to animate almost anything, even the volume level of an audio track. Creating movement with keyframes is simple enough. You move the clip to the position you want to start at, and click this little button to create a keyframe. You then move your cursor to the end of the clip, and move the clip itself to the end position, and you have animation. The simplicity of this system is actually going to be a lifesaver in later projects. After I got the hang of keyframes and motion, I continued editing rapidly, and I finished the entire introduction, which makes up the first 40 seconds of the video. I woke up on day 4 and decided it was time to jump back into Fusion. I had been defeated the first time by the dauntingly complex UI, and now I wanted to vanquish my opponent once and for all, but this time I had a trick up my sleeve. Questionable YouTube tutorials. For my first major Fusion composition, I chose what I thought would be a simple enough creation, an RGB split effect. I was very wrong about the simple part. Even with the YouTube tutorial which seemed to be narrated by an AI with low battery, it took me ages to get this working, and I had to copy and paste a bunch of complex expressions from the video into boxes in the inspector. I honestly had no idea what I was doing, and once I got it working, I immediately noticed an issue. I wanted the RGB split to work horizontally, but the one from the tutorial had both horizontal and vertical elements. This meant I had to completely rewrite the expressions that I already barely understood, which took forever and still ended up looking questionable. Once I had created the effect, I wanted to animate it so I could show the image I was creating the effect for sliding into focus. Remember when I said that keyframes could animate almost anything? Yeah, they can animate fusion effects as well. This, at least, was simple enough to get working. I added a zoom effect to the clip and called it a day. It was day 5 and I had a problem. I had just spent an entire day of editing on one mediocre looking effect which applied for less than half a second. I was now 4 sevenths of the way through my allotted editing time, and had only edited 50 seconds of a 5 minute 16 second video, which meant in 57% of the challenge I had only edited 16% of the video. Fortunately, it was the weekend, and the weather was beautiful, which always boosts my motivation. 
it was time to get in as much editing as I could in one day. Day 5's editing was mostly straightforward, typical stuff which you can find in all my videos. Gameplay clips, text, random gifs, and other assorted elements. There were a few highlights, such as this clip, where I combined movement and zoom keyframes to create my most complex animation yet, and this one where I used rotation and movement together. I also added a section where you could hear the sound effects from the game, which required me to do a bit more work on the audio editing. The coolest thing I created on day 5, however, was this confetti effect. I used Fusion's particle system to make it, and while it doesn't look great, I was pretty proud of it. Unfortunately, whenever I tried to view it in playback, it was extremely laggy due to the particles. I could not manage to fix this, so eventually I actually copied and pasted the effect into a new project, exported the project as a video clip, and added the clip to the timeline of the video. Throughout the day, I managed to edit slightly more than one minute of the video, which meant I was still far behind schedule, but catching up. Day 6 was another day of constant editing. I was quite efficient on this day because much of the section of the video was simple gameplay footage, which I just had to record, cut up, and arrange. I did, however, create one really cool effect. This clip, which shows the player on a speedy moving platform. It's made up of a few core elements. The first element is the actual clip. I took an image of the player and an image of the moving platform, merged them, and then added a slight up and down movement. The next element was the particles, and for the first time, I was going to do something in Fusion without any tutorial. I created a particle emitter, and added a bitmap of a thin white rectangle. I then changed some of the settings to get the desired speed and number, and finished it up with some blur. The final element of the effect was a simple camera shake. It's barely noticeable, but it does a lot to really get the feeling of speed. Shortly after creating the confetti effect, I had learned that there was a way to simply load fusion clips so that they wouldn't lag without having to make a separate project. This function is called render in place. But for some reason, no matter how many times I tried with all sorts of different settings, I just couldn't get it to work. Something was broken, and I didn't know what, but the system would only work if I disabled Fusion. After spending forever attempting to debug this, I eventually settled for using saver and loader nodes in Fusion to save the effect and reload it. Don't worry, I don't understand it either. This improved the performance significantly, and while it was still a bit laggy in playback, it was perfectly fine in the final export of the video. Finally, I had reached the last day of the challenge. Today, it was all or nothing. I either finished the video and rendered it, or I failed the entire challenge and all my effort was wasted. At this point in the video, the story had really taken over, so most of the edits were simple clips of gameplay, with a few bits of text and images sprinkled in. But I fully intended to go out with a bang. I had one final effect up my sleeve. This final effect was going to be my most ambitious fusion creation yet. I was going to need to animate an image of a soul circling the screen, and add glow and particles. Over the last six days, I had picked up many skills in Resolve, and now it was time to put them all to the test. I began by animating the movement of the soul, which was simple but quite annoying, as I had to adjust both the position and the anchor point of the image to get it to work. Next, I went into Fusion and added Glow. This too was easy, and I really liked how it looked. Now I needed to add particles. I had done this many times, but I had never used a moving emitter. This presented a problem which seemed to be unsolvable. The way particles work in Fusion involves a minimum of two nodes, the emitter and the renderer. These work perfectly fine in most cases, but for this effect they had an issue. When the emitter moves, the particles move with it. I wanted the soul to leave a trail of particles, as they do in the game the video was about. However, unlike Godot's particle emitter, the one in Fusion doesn't have a setting to make the particle positions independent of the emitter. I searched for over an hour for a solution. I tried all sorts of different nodes, learned a ton about the fusion particle system, and even tried using transforms to detect the movement of the soul so I could apply a force to the particles in the opposite direction. Nothing was working. Even ChatGPT was stumped. It seemed like implementing my idea was going to be impossible. But just when I was about to give up, one last link appeared in my Google search results, and while it may have seemed hopeless, my eight years of experience as a programmer have taught me to never underestimate a locked, years-old Reddit thread with only one comment. I clicked the link, and for the first time, I found someone who had actually managed to do it. They had succeeded in making the particles independent of the emitter. The only problem was they had implemented the effect totally differently than I had, using a tracker node, which meant I had to restart the effect from the beginning. But now that I knew it was possible, all my motivation returned. I figured out how trackers work, wrote the required expressions, and pressed play. It worked. There was the glowing soul, going around in circles while leaving a trail of particles behind it. I had succeeded. I added music to the video, and it was done. In one week, I had gone from not even having visited DaVinci Resolve's website to having edited one full video, complete with effects that I never could have dreamed of creating in my old editor. 
Now, to see the final result of my work, just click right here.